If you're chasing that elusive cinematic look, chances are what you're really trying to do is make digital footage feel like it was shot on film. Recently, the folks at Dehancer reached out to me and asked if I wanted to check out their plugin that they claim can deliver an authentic analog look. But is this the real deal? Now, to be clear, Dehancer did give me free access for a few weeks, but they're not paying me to make this video. They can't make me say anything I don't want to. And depending on when you're watching this, you might be seeing this video before they do. I've got no interest in shilling for anyone. And if you ever hear me saying nice things about a product or a service, it's because I actually use it and I actually like it. Now with that out of the way, I want to explain what I'm looking for in a plugin like this. Here at Visual Aid, we make hundreds of videos a year. So speed is very important to me. When I've used things like Resolve's built-in film print emulation LUTs or the Film Look Creator, I don't apply it shot by shot. I want the same effects touching every shot because I want a cohesive look. And then I grade the shots underneath it and fix anything that needs fixing. So with that in mind, let's jump into Resolve and I'll show you how this works. I'm going to use the Helen and John reference image from Ari that you might have seen on this channel before. It was shot on the Alexa Mini in Log C3 and I transcoded it to ProRes just to help with playback. You can get this shot from the Ari website and I'll leave a link to it in the description for you. Here you can see my project settings for color. Now I usually color manage my footage using color space transform nodes and groups. I made a video about that which I'll link to below. But the short version is I turn all my footage from the camera color space into the DaVinci Wide Gamma Intermediate. I do all my grading in that and then my final node converts it to Rec 709. But I'm going to use a simple tree today just so it's super obvious what's going on. This first node is my input CST. Then I'll have a couple of nodes for grading if I need them. Here at the end, we're converting to Rec 709. And right before that, I'm going to add Dehancer. And then I'll hit Shift and F on my keyboard to show just the footage and the controls. Now, right away, we've got my first criticism, and that's that it starts with all sorts of things turned on. I want to start with a completely blank slate, but to do that, I have to scroll through all the different sections and get to the very bottom. And under Options, select Disable All Tools. While we're down here, there's a couple of important things to look at. Once you've paid for your license, you click here to sign in and get it up and running. You'll also want to click this Check Profiles button. And if it's your first time using it, you'll download all the camera and film emulation profiles that you need to make it work. There's also a quality drop down. If you're having trouble with playback, have this set to normal, but you want to make sure it's set to high when you're exporting your final video. All right, let's scroll all the way back to the top and work our way through this tool. As you can see, there are a ton of different settings, so I'm going to go through it as quickly as I can. I highly recommend you go to their website where they give you way more information about what every slider does than I've got time to do right here. First things first, we need to select our input. We've got a few options here, and it needs to match what's being fed into it, which in my case is DaVinci Wide Gamma Intermediate. Another option if you aren't working in a color managed workflow like me is that you can have this effect as the last node and tell it what camera source you're feeding it. It will then convert the output to Rec. 709. Then you've got controls for exposure, color temperature, and color tint. You would use these to correct the footage before all the effects are applied. But I want to do that with my normal grading controls earlier in the tree, so I'm going to leave these alone. Now we're getting to the first of two film profile sections. If you were actually shooting film, you would then take that negative, develop it, and print it back to another film that you'd actually project. So there's actually two different film stocks involved in the process. This first option is where you pick an emulation of what film the footage was captured on. There's a super long list here that breaks down into several categories. Motion picture films, which as the name suggests are the films most movies are shot on. Then we've got color positive and color negative films. A positive film is a true to life image that's designed to be viewed as a slide or a transparency on a light table. And a negative film makes an inverted image where the colors and brightness are reversed. Then we've got some black and white films, some instant films, and some weird experimental ones. I did a little research and the vast majority of these are actually still photography films other than the ones I'm highlighting here. If I've missed any, please let me know in the comments. I'm gonna use Sunny Still 800T for this. The push pull control affects the color and contrast of the film and it behaves differently depending on the film you've selected. Then you've got some developer tools. If you don't have any change in the contrast boost slider, the gamma correction and color separation tools in this section don't work. So that's something to keep in mind. To my eye, this is a little desaturated, so I'm going to nudge the color boost a little bit. Okay, usually when you shoot on film, clipping in the highlights happens much later than on digital cameras. So this film compression tool gives you a more compressed tonal range in the highlights, which looks more like film. It might not be immediately obvious what's happening, but if I apply this to a gradient and pull up my waveform, you can see the effect these controls are having. It won't rescue highlights that are completely clipped in the original footage, but it does seem to give a nicer roll off. The expand tool lets you set different black and white points to change the contrast of the film emulation. Then we get to the print section. On their website, they suggest you follow the pipeline that you'd be using in real life, matching the print medium with the film you used. So you would use the linear profile with positive films because you wouldn't be printing those to anything. 
Kodak 2383 or Fujifilm 3513 for movie stocks, and Kodak Endura paper for photographic negative films that you'd be printing to look at. But obviously rules are made to be broken, so experiment and see what effect you get. Since I'm using a movie stock, I'll use the Fujifilm print. There are a few sliders where you can make some general adjustments and one tick box that's worth knowing about. By default, print adjustments use the standard digital contrast range, where black equals zero and white equals 100. To get a softer image with more detail in the darkest and brightest areas, turn on the analog range limiter. It uses the original black and white values from the reference prints. The color head section is emulating an analog color correction tool you find in photo enlargers, where you can change the color of the light used for print exposure. The film grain is one of the coolest parts of this plugin. They don't just overlay grain on top of the image, but rather reconstruct the shot out of grain. They've got a few different presets, and once you pick one, you can select custom to really dial in the grain the way you want it. I don't use grain that often, but when I do, I tend to go with bigger stocks because they're more subtle than something like 8mm. Halation is like a glow or halo that appears around very bright areas in a photo, especially when those areas are next to much darker ones. It happens when light goes all the way through the film and then bounces off the camera's insides, hitting the film a second time. When you look at these film options, you'll see half of them that say no remjet. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. That means it's the same film with the anti-halation layer removed, so the effect's way more pronounced. Halation can also lead to a bit of red glare on skin, so that's something to keep in mind. It would usually occur in the real world with Bloom, the next effect, so you probably want to turn them both on and work in tandem. Bloom is a soft glowing effect that only appears around very bright light sources or highlights in your image. It mimics how light used to subtly bleed into darker areas on actual film. Unlike a general soft focus effect that blurs everything, Bloom is specifically focused on making bright lights look like they're gently glowing. Honestly, unless I was going for a real stylized old timey look, I don't ever use the next few effects. Film damage lets you add dust, hair and scratches to your image. Like some of the previous sections, start with a preset and then go to custom and really dial it in. The film breath effect is an accidental change in exposure, contrast and color from frame to frame as the film moves. Gateweave emulates the film moving around a little bit in the projector. Overscan shows the film gate so you can see the edge of the frame, the perforations, things like that. Then you've got a vignette tool, which honestly is something I would do in the grade rather than here. There are a couple of extra utilities they've thrown in. You've got false color, which gives you a visual representation of the exposure of your shot, and an effect to warn you about anything clipping too bright or dark. Then they've got a total impact slider, where you can turn down the overall opacity of the effect and blend your original image back in if the emulation is too strong. You've also got the ability to export the changes you've made with the plugin as a LUT. Keep in mind that LUTs can only contain color and luminance changes that affect the whole image. It won't include vignettes, the overscan overlays, grain, halation, bloom, anything like that. Also, for some reason, that option's grayed out for me, and I don't know why. I didn't find anything on their website to explain it, but there's a chance I've missed something. They've got a ton of material to read for all these tools. And now it's time for my honest opinion. I should preface this by saying I have never shot with film in my life, so I can't speak to how accurate these emulations actually are. I think the biggest benefit might also be my biggest criticism. You see, there's so many sections and so many tweaks that you can make. You can really dial in some really unique and kind of bespoke looks, right? But at the same time, when I was experimenting with it, I found myself with kind of a decision paralysis. As I mentioned at the start of this, we make hundreds of videos here every single year, and it can be really tempting to noodle with this plugin for ages, trying out all of the different options. Also, there aren't any presets that you can start with to get some kind of idea as how all of these different elements are supposed to work together. And as someone who isn't familiar with how film development works, it's not a super intuitive thing for me. What I'm going to have to do is spend some time kind of creating a few looks that I like, and I can save those as power grades, and I'll apply them with a couple of clicks. Because I worry I'll lose so much time experimenting when I've got a deadline to hit. The other thing I need to do is have two instances of the effect. One is my overall film look that's attached to every single shot, so I've got consistency between each one. But then I need the ability to dial in things like grain and halation and bloom on a shot by shot basis. Those are actually my favorite parts of the plugin, and they do have separate plugins just for those. Here are all the different apps that are available for Resolve. Dehancer Pro is what I was using. There's a light version that only includes film profiles, film grain, bloom, color head, and camera profiles. Then there's separate plugins for film grain, bloom, halation, and breath and damage. Now, as you can see, while these are lifetime purchases with free updates, this is not a cheap set of plugins, especially when you consider you can buy DaVinci Resolve Studio for $295. They also offer a subscription model, which lets you download all the plugins for several different platforms, as well as an iOS app for photo and video, and you get access to Dehancer Online, which is a browser-based photo editing app. The features and interface in this thing are very different to the plugin. It comes with 48 different preset combinations of film profiles and print profiles, something that would be nice to see in the Resolve plugin. 
Is this an impressive plugin? Yes, absolutely. But especially at this price point, I would very much put this in the category of nice to have rather than must have. If you're using the free version of Resolve and you're thinking about this, I would say spend your money on the Resolve Studio instead. Aside from the built-in film look creator that's going to get you some of the Hans's functionality, you'll also get access to so many other tools for editing and for audio and for color and for visual effects that it's an absolute steal in comparison to this. If you are thinking about trying out Dehancer, they have given me a 10% discount code that works for everything except the iOS app. So that will remove a little bit of the sting. Just enter TOM10, that's T-H-O-M 10 for your discount. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.